A trifecta of daily losses for the S&P amid a trifecta of expirations in the options market. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Romaine used the word trifecta. This is the third straight day of losses for the S&P 500. In fact, it's only gained one time this week, and that was to a record high. So are we at an inflection point? It's a good question. Right now, we're looking at a decline of just over half of 1%. You've got $5.3 trillion of options set to expire today, so we're expecting a pickup in volume and perhaps some volatility. Matt Miller of Miller Tabak says, don't read too much into today's action to decipher some big themes in the coming days. Uh, U.S. Treasury started the day down higher, but then they gave up those gains. And now you can see that uh, yields are moving up on the 10-year, moving up by one basis point at the moment. Uh, but this is the fifth straight day that the yield on the 10-year has moved higher. And commodities are uh, starting to become a source of inflation concerns. Copper surging to a 13-month high. There's some uh, supply cut issues in places like Zambia and Panama. And that, of course, is feeding into concerns about inflation. Romain? Yeah, really interesting price action here on this Friday, particularly when it comes to stocks and that large cap sell-off continuing anew here. The S&P poised right now to log its first back-to-back -back weekly loss going back to October, while that sell-off in Treasuries, as Scarlett was talking about, that's pushing two-year yields up for the week by the most since May. Now, the dual sell-offs that we're seeing in stocks and bonds, not to mention the strength in the dollar, that's capping a week of economic data that really did intensify that debate around the degree of Fed easing this year. Remember, market expectations for the first time this year are reflecting fewer, fewer than three quarter point cuts for 2024, a far cry from two months ago when swaps pricing showed consensus was on as many as six cuts. Now, a big part of the debate at the Fed meeting that occurs next week really won't just be about the stickiness of inflation, but really about the overall economic vibes, which for many Americans still remain an issue. Many Americans, I should say, who remain leveraged to the hilt. Fed data out this month showed that interest payments on consumer credit cards, auto loans, and other non-real estate debt are for the first time ever as big of a financial burden as mortgage interest payments. Now, there was a February paper from the IMF and Harvard researchers on this topic, and they showed how higher borrowing costs and really the higher cost of servicing that debt, which, of course, isn't captured in those inflation figures, is really key to understanding why consumer sentiment remains lackluster. That preliminary March reading for the University of Michigan sentiment survey, that was out earlier this morning, and it did show that while general expectations are holding in line with previous reports, there is a division out there emerging between the affluent who are able to maintain their living standards and middle-income consumers who are still reeling from the effects of that two-year spike in inflation. A spike in inflation, Scarlett, we should point out, peaked almost a year and a half ago. Yeah, it's a really yeah. good point. So let's show you what that all looks like. This is the University of Michigan's main consumer confidence index. It goes all the way back to 1980. And here's the slight drop in March that Romain was talking about, just 76 and a half, when economists had anticipated an improvement to 77.1. So sentiment has mostly leveled off since rising more than 17 points uh, in December and January. That's that big move there. Goldman Sachs points out that the current reading puts us halfway between the pre-pandemic levels and the historic trough reached in June of 2022. Romain? All right. Well, who better to talk to than Joanne Shu, Director of Consumer Surveys at the University of Michigan, joining us now to help kick us off to the close. And uh, Joanne, as you know, I mean, this is an economy not driven not just, of course, by the underlying data, but by consumer sentiment, how people feel about the economy. And it was interesting to look at the report today. And you do get a I guess, a, a broader sense of the divide out there right now between those folks who, despite having maybe flush bank accounts, despite having jobs, don't actually feel good about economic conditions. That's right. Um, I think consumers um, are looking really at a whole breadth of information around them. And, you know, consistently over the last couple of years, consumers have felt quite a bit of confidence in labor markets, but that hasn't really been enough to offset the negative feelings um, that are coming from high inflation. That being said, consumers have noticed that inflation is nowhere as high as it was in, in um, mid-2022. You see that in their inflation expectations that have come down quite considerably. However, a, a large share, over one-third of consumers, continue to tell us that high prices are weighing down their personal finances. I, I was also curious about some of the data that seemed to suggest that 
part of the concern consumers have right now is kind of the lack of visibility or the lack of certainty, I guess, that they have about economic conditions going forward. So for even those folks who maybe felt good about current conditions, it just seems that there's this opaqueness right now about what transpires over the next few months or years. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty that's being expressed by consumers, uh, more so over the long term than, than the short term. Um, we ask questions both over the, the year ahead horizon as well as five to 10 years. And what a lot of consumers are telling us is they can't really tell us what's going to happen in five to 10 years because it depends on the election. And so consumers are really looking forward, looking ahead at um, the presidential election coming up in November and reserving judgment over the trajectory of the economy until that comes into better focus. Yeah, that lack of visibility is very frustrating. And I'm glad you bring up the election because there have been studies done in the past that show there's as much a political divide as there is an income divide in terms of how people view uh, the current situation. Uh, Democrats, when there's a Democratic president uh, in charge, feel a bit better about the economy, while Republicans uh, don't feel as good. Are you seeing that in the data that you have? Does it, does it slice the data in that way so that it's visible? Yes. I mean, that's something we have seen um, for, for decades, actually. It's, it's always the case that um, consumers who belong to the political party that's in the White House tend to have more favorable levels of sentiment than people who belong to the other party. And right now is no different. Um, Democrats see, um, see the economy both currently and their expectations much more favorably than independents who see it more favorably than Republicans. That being said, you, know, you just showed us the, uh, the, the dramatic increase in sentiment that we saw uh, between November and January. And that um, and those are trends that we saw across all three political groups. So it didn't matter what party you belonged to or if you were an independent, everyone saw that um, saw that improvement between November and January. And all three groups have been relatively stable between January, February and this first reading in March. OK, so if that's the case, then what what do you think is changing now? We, we saw a dramatic improvement uh, from November to January, but now things have kind of leveled off. Why is that? The dramatic improvement looking back at that was largely because consumers were starting to finally um, feel confident that inflation was truly going to slow down, that it wasn't going to come back. And that was something that was internalized um, at the end of 2023. Um, and then once that was fully internalized by January, uh, consumers have been looking around them and don't see any signs um, of any sort of dramatic changes or clear changes, either positive or negative, in the economy. So essentially, we're, we're flat because consumers don't see don't see any information that leads them to to believe otherwise. And again, um, they sense the uncertainty ahead of them. And so they're reserving judgment at this time. And we only have about a minute left. But I am curious, Joanne, if you could kind of close the loop for us here. When we talk about these sentiment indicators and how people feel, uh, how much of a direct correlation can you find or can you track at least uh, with future purchases, the idea that if people are feeling a little bit less, they're maybe not going to travel or not necessarily buy those big ticket items. Is that correlation still strong? So historically, the correlation has been been remarkably strong um, with consumer sentiment being a le leading indicator for how people are planning out their purchases in the future. Now, that relationship did shift quite a bit in 2022 and 2023 um, with consumers feeling quite dismal about the economy and having very low levels of sentiment, but still spending quite robustly. And the reason for that is because of the strong labor market and consumer recognition that labor markets are strong. And indeed, right now, consumers still feel quite confident that that their jobs are secure. They feel quite confident that they're going to see income gains ahead. However, they don't. Most of them don't do not expect these income gains to outstrip inflation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think consumers still feel comfortable spending at this time um, because they feel secure in their current situations. Um, but that could certainly change going forward. All right, uh, Joanne. Always great to talk to you, Joanne Shu. She's director of consumer surveys at the University of Michigan, former Fed economist as well. As we kick you off to the close here on this Friday afternoon, with a closer look at that divide in perceptions of economic conditions and the wedge creating that divide: high consumer credit card balances and even higher debt servicing costs. A discussion ahead with one of the top-rated analysts covering the sector. Plus, we take a look at Zillow. It is our stock of the hour. It and other real estate platforms are plunging following a court settlement that could result in lower fees for agents. The details coming up. And super microcomputer Decker's into it among the companies joining the S&P 500 starting on Monday when the index rebalances after the close today. A closer look at those companies going in and those companies coming out. All that and more coming up right here on the big program. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
U.S. families feeling increasingly squeezed by the high cost of carrying debt. Delinquency rates on credit cards and auto loans have risen to the highest in more than a decade. And for the first time ever, the interest on that debt is just as high as mortgage interest payments. Bloomberg senior reporter for Distressed Debt, Eliza Ronald Hannon, has been looking into this trend. She joins us now from Atlanta. Great to speak with you, Eliza. I remember when the Fed first began raising interest rates, there was a lot of discussion about how it's okay because household balance sheets are still really strong. People are in good shape. Are analysts still saying that household balance sheets are in good shape? Well, not as much. And what is particularly noteworthy is that the difference between um, those who have more wealth to begin with and the lower quartiles of earners is pretty distinct. Um, the, some of the data we show in the story is that not only are default rates higher for lower earners, but they're rising more quickly. So, you know, some of the offsets of the inflation, inflationary pressures have come from wealth generated by increasing home values or stock market gains, and those are not available to the average middle class or lower earner. So they're getting to experience only the inflation and none of the boon of the wealth creation. Now, this has kind of been actually a big part of the story coming out of, uh, really going into the uh, pandemic, of course, when we had that wage growth, which finally kicked in after years, only to get eaten away by inflation. Now you're talking about the higher debt services costs here. Is this going to become an election year issue? Absolutely. You know, we have the research shows that voters consider their own economic prosperity and their own path to prosperity very strongly when they're at the ballot box. So the, you know, the narrative that is formed in the next few months um, by the different campaigns is going to is going to matter in how and how they are really telling themselves that story. But ultimately, there are major pressures and the higher cost of borrowing factors heavily into how people consider their prosperity. So that's going to be really hard to erode or do a backtrack at all before the election. So the debt burden is definitely higher for consumers. Is this mainly floating rate debt? Because if it is, once the Federal Reserve starts cutting interest rates, and I know that we have no visibility on that, the burden mm -hmm. should lessen, right? It should and it could, but we do make the point that sometimes, depending on your balance and your situation, you know, the fees involved in refinancing can be prohibitive. Uh, it's, it's quite expensive. Um, the pure administrative work involved can also be prohibitive. And so not only that, but the, you know, it's a little bit of a snowball effect. When your credit card balance grows and you're not able to pay down more than the minimum per month, it quickly gets pretty out of hand and that becomes an overhang that is, takes years to get get out from under. Why, why don't you think there was a little bit more discussion about this when we saw those balances going up? Everyone kept saying, look, on a historical basis, not that bad, even though it was at a record. And they kept pointing to these ratios. Do we not look at those debt servicing ratios at the time or do we misinterpret them? Um, I think, you know, not necessarily either. Um, it's just notable that now that it has actually come to pass, one of the takeaways that's pretty significant is actually how it factors into sentiment. So, Again, it might not have been um, as heavy of a weight on voters or on people's perceptions of their own prosperity if inflation hadn't been so sharp for a little while there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the far great, greater historical scheme, there is, of course, more dramatic examples. Um, yeah. So it, it, yeah. it's all in context. But yeah. um, it was, you know, it was anticipated, but it's... It's tough to see when it really arrives. All right. Well, still a, a real fascinating look here. Great reporting, Eliza. Eliza Ronald uh, Hannon, Bloomberg's senior reporter for Distressed Debt. A closer look uh, at the balance sheet uh, of consumers out there and how it might actually uh, affect the election this year. And, I mean, how many times have we talked about over various election cycles in history? Nixon, Carter, mm -hmm. uh, Bush, uh, Clinton, and, of course, even with uh, Trump uh, coming in in 2016. It's not what those numbers say on paper. It's how yeah. people feel. Absolutely. That's, that's the, our economy. That's our economy. Yeah. I mean, you can throw as many financial yeah. analysts and economists at it, but what mm. we really need are psychologists to kind of <laughs> yes. break down how yeah. people behave when they feel a certain way. And it's all, everyone has recency bias, right? I mean, yeah. things might be coming down, inflation might be coming down, but it's nothing like it, what it was pre-pandemic. And yeah. that's the thing that sticks in everyone's head. Yeah, and, and it gets to this idea too, it's like, is that something you can fix? Or certainly, and I mean, when I say fix it, I mean like before yeah. November, which is probably no, because it's right. kind of out of the hands of the White House. And, you know, if Jay Powell is, 
is independent, you know, he's not going to do anything. And as know. long as you keep yeah. getting your credit card bill and you're seeing those yeah. numbers increase, then that's an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, we're going to uh, stick on this topic here uh, as we uh, head uh, towards the closing bells here. Get another read on consumer debt. Seaport Research actually cut its recommendation on Discover Financial. You want to hear why? We're going to talk to that analyst behind the call in just a second. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls. The big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. We're going to start here with Dollar General. Telsey Advisory raising its recommendation to outperform, saying that the discount retailer once plagued by high product loss and labor headwinds, seeing a turnaround. Analyst Joe Feldman saying a balanced approach to store growth and those fresh offerings of produce are steps in the right direction. And he sees double-digit earnings growth for the second half of this year and beyond. Shares getting a modest bid today, up about 1%. Next up, let's take a look at Rivian, an upgrade there to overweight over at Piper Sandler with a $21 price target. Analyst Alexander Potter says while buying the stock is a risky move, he expects investors to still tilt bullish around Rivian's forthcoming R2 model and the company's plan to rein in capital expenditures. A four-day drop in those stocks coming to an end. The shares rallying 3% here on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Discover. Getting cut to neutral over at Seaport Research. The analyst Bill Ryan, while he sees some improvements in consumer delinquencies, says credit card portfolio growth did slow last month. He says the downgrade also reflects Capital One's uh, bid to buy Discover, which he's confident will close in late 2024 or in early 2025. The share has taken a leg lower here by about 3% here on the day. And those are some of our top calls. And we do actually want to stay on that last call there with Discover and bring Bill Ryan into the conversation. Senior analyst covering specialty finance at Seaport Research Partners. And Bill, I I want to start off first with this broader issue right now about delinquencies and where a consumer credit card, you know, bills stand right now. You've actually seen Delinquencies go up, but in your latest note on Discover, you say they might have actually peaked and might have actually started to improve already. Is that still the case? Yes, it is. And the way I describe what we're seeing is a K-shaped recovery. Uh, you're definitely seeing higher-end consumers do very well or better. And then if you look at uh, you know subprime consumers or non-prime consumers, low-end prime consumers, they're definitely struggling with uh, inflation over the last several years. And in relation to, I hate to call it exactly improvement, but we refer to it as delinquency formation rates. Mm -hmm. And what is happening is, is that you had a big surge in delinquencies over the past, you know, call it 18 months, but that rate of increase has started to slow. And that is at least getting some, you know, call it an early sign that perhaps net charge off charge offs may be peaking here in the first half of the year and start to improve in the second half of the year. And that's what we're watching for. And you know, Discover and most of the credit card issuers put out their credit data today for the month of February, and pretty much on a universal basis, yeah. you did see delinquency formation rates actually start to slow. When you look at the other side of the coin here, which is portfolio growth, the credit card portfolio growth that Discover, what has been behind that slowdown? Is that something that I guess is being driven internally, or is that more market forces and consumers pulling back? It is a combination of pretty much all of the above. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can start off with all the all the credit card issuers have really kind of tightened to some degree. And so that is starting to be reflected in the growth rates. They implemented it last year, and you're seeing it uh, kind of spill over into the growth rates uh, this year. So the second uh, key point uh, that I would make is consumers have dialed back on their spending. And most of the issuers uh, have, have basically stated that you're seeing flat spending growth on a year-over-year basis at this point. So the only growth that you're getting right now is basically from new accounts and what they refer to as slowing payment rates. Mm-hmm. You know, people dialing back about how much they pay off their credit card every month. And so that's kind of what bolstering what growth rates that we are seeing this year. Right, so leaving more in, in terms of that outstanding payment that they have to service. Um, what kind of growth rate do you expect for those balances, those outstanding balances? Uh, it's probably going to be in the mid single digits uh, on a uh, let's just call it on a per account basis. Uh, the the struggles that I think some of the credit card companies are having right now with growth, and this does you know relate to credit spectrum as well, because obviously lower credit spectrums have higher charge off rates. The charge off rates have become a headwind for these companies in terms of the ability to grow, uh, and that is reflected in the numbers. But I'm basically I would I would account 
or I would uh, forecast kind of mid single digit type growth at this point. Mm. Uh, we have gotten past the balance rebuilding past COVID, and that is fully reflected in the numbers that we're seeing right now. Romain had mentioned that your downgrade reflects um, Capital One's decision to buy Discover. You're thinking that this will close uh, later this year or early 2025. Mm -hmm. Why would this be a negative for the stock? Or is this a case of it's not happening soon enough? It is. I would, I would say it maybe might be happening soon enough because uh, if you look at the discount Discover is currently trading at relative to its acquisition price, it's about a 14 to 15 percent discount. And you know, if you assign the probabilities, you know, what are investors assigning to the probabilities of this acquisition actually closing? It's about 50-50. And, you know, there's been a lot of noise in, in the background with politicians, you know, saying this should never happen. But at the end of the day, and here's why I think it will happen, is you got to break Discover's business and what's happening into two parts. You've got the card issuing side, uh, and Cap One with Discover is going to be the largest issuer by outstanding balances. Mm -hmm. And it will be the third largest in terms of credit card payment volume. And then on the other side, you've got the network. Right. And Discover, there's only four credit card networks out there. Discover has a 5% market share. Visa has close to 60. MasterCard has close to 25. And so, you know, as much as the regulators, and I'd say, you know, politicians, and they look at this and they say, okay, we may not like to see increases in market share in the industry, but we do not like that there's only four participants uh, that dominate yeah. the credit card payment network. And I think they're going to gravitate to say, we've got to create more competition. And this could be really good for Capital One in the future. Got it. Got it. Bill Ryan, really fascinating stuff. Bill Ryan over at Seaport Research with a recent downgrade of Discover Financial Services. And Romain, uh, Bill was talking about how people are spending less or really cutting back on spending. And you see that in uh, shares of Ulta, which uh, posted its biggest drop in 10 months. Yes, the fourth quarter results beat analyst estimates, mm -hmm. but there was softness in Prestige Cosmetics. That was yeah. a negative. So people are yeah. perhaps downgrading the kinds of cosmetics they buy. Something to keep an eye on. Of course, you remember the old lipstick indicator. Yeah. I guess maybe the Ulta indicator might be an update of that, given that everyone's moved on from uh, lipstick to, you know, some overpriced, you know, creams for your face. Did those creams actually work, by the way? I mean, I'm yeah. hoping because yeah. I'm investing in those. Because I once spent like $100 on one of those bottles. Really? And, and I think it didn't really change anything. Well, you have to stick yeah. with it. That's part of the, oh. the scheme, <laughs> that's the gimmick. How, that's how they get you, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> by the way, we're going to have much more on cosmetic spending uh, next week. We're going to be speaking with the Elf Beauty CEO at 3.30 p.m. New York time next week. All right. And coming up here on the big pro. Program. A closer look at the oil market. Crude oil is set for a 4% gain on the week. Frank Monkham, Senior Portfolio Manager over at NTMO. He's on deck right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is The Countdown to The Close. I'm Romain Bostic. And we have a day in which uh, equities have turned over once again. We've yeah. now strung together third, th three straight days of losses, but four days of declines this week alone. Yeah, four days of decline. Normally, you're the optimist, I'm the pessimist. I'm actually a little more optimistic about this. You want to know why? Why? Because you're still seeing a bit of a rotation. You're still seeing a bid come into some of the cyclical. It's not strong, mm -hmm. but this isn't like that sell-off where everybody's just, you know, cashing out and, and moving to the sidelines. It's like people are sniffing around for something. Whether it gains traction, I think, think that remains to be right. seen, but And the losses yeah. are, are fairly modest, given that mm -hmm. big tech is declining overall. You would think it would be a lot more extreme, but yeah. we're not there yet. Um, it's not just in equities, of course. We're seeing a lot of big moves in commodity prices today as well. Copper surging as supply cuts hit the market, iron ore sinking as demand headwinds mount. The world's most important mined commodities are diverging, while parts of the energy complex, like crude oil, are climbing. So joining us now to discuss what this all means is Frank Mon Monkim. He is Senior Portfolio Manager at Antimo. Hey, Frank. Nice to see you again. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Today. So we've got low volatility and record yep. highs in risky assets like stocks yep. and Bitcoin, yep. but also record highs in gold. Yep. So peaking together all at once is kind of unusual. Yep. What does that mean? Is this a bad sign? Well, um, I don't think it's a bad sign necessarily. I mean, that's kind of where we are in the cycle today. I mean, gold is kind of, you know, it's a different beast. It's a beast of its own, really. Um, there's a lot of tailwind behind gold because of positioning, demand from central banks, et cetera. And the fact that, you know, yields have been kind of coming off a little bit. Now they're back up. I mean, that usually triggers a lot of demand for gold. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like to pivot a little bit, I think, and in, in talk about something that's a little bit more topical here, which is what's happening in the crude markets. Um, and, you know, there seems to be kind of this renewed bullishness in the crude markets nowadays. 
plays. And I think some of it is justified, you know, based on some of the fundamentals. And, and we've seen a lot of, you know, positioning uh, adjustment here in the market. Uh, but I, I do want to highlight one thing, which is the fact that one still needs to remain cognizant of the fact that the Fed is still continuing to hike here. Um, and, you know, we've seen one of the, you know, the steepest monetary well, I'm sorry, tightening. the Fed continuing to hike? Well, not continue to hike. The Fed oh, continue to remains keep restrictive. Oh, okay. right? Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, yeah, the, the, the Fed sure. remains yeah. restrictive here. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, you know, we're seeing, we've seen one of the, you know, the steepest monetary tightening uh, campaigns ever in the history of, of, of markets. Mm -hmm. And well, it's not just that pivot that I'm seeing from the Fed, right? What I'm seeing really is the fact that you've got a Federal Reserve now that's, that, had, that basically went through a faux pas about a year and a half ago with the whole transitory rhetoric uh, around inflation. So to me, in my eyes, well, that's created to, to, to the, into the Fed, right? I mean, it's not, the Fed is not run by any kind of AI software. These are people, these are human <laughs> beings, yeah. right? And their psychology has been, you know, hit a little bit. So there's a little bit of PTSD in the Fed system, so mm -hmm. to speak. So I think that they're making sure that they want to make sure that they, they attack inflation really holistically. So mm -hmm. people talk about CPI, PCE, and try to dissect all of these components underneath it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great exercise to do. Mm -hmm. However, I think the Fed really is not really in the business of doing that, given that inflation is really sticky, right? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if you're saying you're not going to be uh, forward looking anymore, you're going to be data dependent, right? Then you got to react to the data. You got to be consistent with that. Yeah. So, right? what does the data in the energy markets tell the Fed? You've got U.S. stockpiles dropping for the first time since January. Yeah. That's always going to be, it's always going to move around. Um, and demand is certainly continues to be a concern if the economy is going to go into this slow um, descent, not, not a, a retreat or anything, but sure. the economy is not going to grow as quickly as it yeah. had been. Yeah, no, I, I do agree with that. I think what it means. Um, is that you know the same way we've seen you know these this Fed put you know over the years on on equities, especially you know from the GFC onwards. I think things have actually been flipped upside down. All right, we've got a, a Fed call option commodities. Right, I mean I think that if commodities were to spike again, uh, I think the Fed would remain restrictive. Yeah. If anything, they might hike again. I think that's one of the things that commodities investors struggle today to understand. The reason being is we've gone through about 10 to 15 years right. where basically you know the ZERP policy with zero interest rates. So a lot of investors today, a lot of risk takers don't remember the last time, you know, you had an active Fed. Right. You know, Fed days were non-events in the market for commodities yeah. people. Uh, if you had a Fed model, you probably haven't run it in a while. It's sitting somewhere in the shelf. Now right. you got to bring it back to life, <laughs> right. trying to spruce it up, dust it off and try to make sure that it's, it's, it's up to speed. Right? right. And a lot of people have kind of forgotten about that. We've got a Fed that's really active in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You've got interest rates at five and a quarter uh, uh, um, uh, percent here. And the Fed is really not backing down. I mean, we've got PPI, CPI this week, which is yeah. pretty hot. And I think it'll be asinine to think that the Fed is just going to look through this next yeah. week, right? Well, I think they'll talk about this. Th well, this has to be a topic of conversation. I mean, we talk about the rise that we've seen in oil this week. I know we're only at like 81 bucks uh, or something, so we're nowhere near those $100 fever dreams we had. Yep. But then you look at the jump that we've seen in gasoline prices uh, and some of the other distilled products here. Yes. I mean, that has to be a topic of conversation on Tuesday I and Wednesday. Absolutely. I think yeah. that, you know, my base case is... You know, I mean, I think the dot plus is still showing about three cuts for for uh, yeah. for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, the, the market probably, as I was checking this morning, is probably looking at you know maybe a ten percent chance that you know plots get get moved down. Yeah. To, from three to two. Well, I've seen that too. What I, is, but how does that change things for you? Let's say we go we, Wednesday, we see that dot plot instead of sure. three, it maybe it signals something closer to two. Does that sure. change your investment thesis? I think it does. I think yeah. that, that's just going to be a reminder that the Fed is really vigilant about this, uh -huh. and they're not just going to let commodities rip. This notion of, you know, because traditional monetary policy usually looks at core inflation, right? Okay. Because food and energy tends to be really volatile, so you don't want to manage policy around, mm -hmm. you know, something that's super volatile. Mm -hmm. But this time around is very different, right? The Fed wants to bring inflation down to 2%. doesn't matter if it's core, mm -hmm. headline. They're going full on and trying to bring down inflation to target, right? So if they were to move uh, the plots down to two, I think this is going to be a stark reminder to the marketplace that they are really onto this. Yeah. And any spike in, 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 in energy prices, any spike in commodities markets just in general would trigger them to come back and, 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 and perhaps if, hide If again. that dot doesn't move, it stays at three or even maybe potentially even a little higher than that. Does that matter? If it stays at three? Yeah. 
Well, I think that's the base case today. So okay. the reaction function to the, mar to the marketplace gotcha. is not yeah. going to it's not going to be any different to, than what we're seeing okay. now. I think what's not fully priced in right now is the fact that the Fed could actually downshift to two. Gotcha. Got it. Yeah. If we were to see that, then I think yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll usher a lot of volatility, you know, from cross asset perspective next week. So Frank, you're a portfolio manager, but you're based in Washington, which is kind of unusual. There's not a lot of portfolio managers in Washington, yeah. but you do have access to a lot of policymakers who are thinking bigger picture when it comes to the economy and policy. What do they say about commodities like oil. How are they thinking about it? Well, the way that they're thinking about it is they're very sort of sensitive to what's happening geo geopolitically, mm -hmm. especially the folks in Washington. As you can see, you've seen Washington being really active in trying to make sure that, you know, they, they're working on the peace, uh, get, that the Middle East, East gets some kind of peace deal, you know, with Hamas. So they're seeing, they're clearly seeing a correlation between what's happening in the Middle East and, and you know, the, the inflation picture in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's really the, the, the right tail risk to commodities. It's really another geopolitical flare up that, that would basically reactivate the right tail of, of that distribution, and they're aware of that. And uh, that's definitely uh, front and center in, into discussions in Washington as it pertains to, you know, inflation. All right, Frank, uh, great discussion here. Frank Monkham there, he's Senior Portfolio Manager over at Antimo. Closer look at the commodity space. We've seen a ton of price activity uh, in that space over the last few months. You started off talking about the moves in copper or gold, but uh, I mean, if Alex were here, she would also point out that a lot of the volatility we've been seeing in oil and, and uh, energy. Yeah, absolutely. I look at the CRB indexes, mm -hmm. and it's at a four and a half month high. This has happened kind of quietly. We don't talk enough about it, but um, when we talk about what the Fed's going to focus on when it comes to inflation, it feels like this is going to be a feeder into that idea that inflation is sticky. Yeah, and don't forget now you're looking at uh, prices at the pump now up about 30% to start the year here, so it could become a big issue for consumers and maybe even for the president. We already know the housing market is a big issue as well, but today maybe there was a sign of a little bit of a relief. National, The National Association of Realtors did finally settle that big case that they've been up against now for the last couple of years. That's going to change how agents are paid and it could change how Americans buy and sell their homes. So companies like Zillow, you're seeing those stocks take a little bit of a hit today. That is our stock of the hour. That discussion's coming up next. This is the close on Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our stock of the hour, taking a closer look at Zillow. The shares right now having their worst day going back to late 2021. This is after the National Association of Realtors here in the U.S. agreed to settle litigation over commission rules for its agents. Now, that could potentially result in lower fees going to these real estate companies. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now has been all over this story here. And Abigail, anyone who knows who's bought a home in the U.S., typically you pay somewhere in the neighborhood of about 5 to 6 percent. The seller pays that. And, of course, that gets split up amongst the agents. There was a big lawsuit over this saying that this amounted to certain degrees of collusion, antitrust issues that's now been settled. I assume those fees are coming down. Yes, uh, that yeah. is correct. One would assume yeah. that's the case because the 6% mm -hmm. fee is basically gone. And we broke that news last November when mm -hmm. that Missouri jury found NAR and some two brokerages mm -hmm. uh, guilty or for um, keep conspiring to keep commissions artificially high. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a $1.8 billion award there in damages, but it could have amounted to $5.4 billion because of the antitrust factor. So today, mm -hmm. NAR came out saying that they've agreed to settle this litigation, and it goes years and years back. So this is not necessarily a surprise to people who have been watching this closely to end these landmark cases uh, and to settle the litigation. They're paying $418 million in damages. They're eliminating the commission rules. Right. And that means that that standard 5 to 6% is gone. So when we think about okay. it on the average house, $400,000 yeah. or so, uh, that is basically $25,000 prior with current, mm -hmm. uh, and it could fall by 6 to 12K. Sorry, just to be clear, though. Uh, so when we talk about the commission rules being gone now, does that mean this is kind of open season? for negotiating? I, I, that's that, my interpretation of okay. it. I think that there's going to be a lot to be seen in terms yeah. of what is next uh, exactly. Uh, and that's one gotcha. of the reasons okay. that some of these brokerages are down because yeah. that 6% that they were just getting, they're yeah. no longer going to be getting. There's also, uh, they agreed to put in new rules. Commissions are now prohibited from being shown on listings. Uh, they've also ended the requirement for brokers to subscribe to the various multi multiple listing services, which we all oh, know about it when yeah, you buy yeah. and sell. Yeah, that's so, so 
So that, that secrecy that is gone, it almost reminds me of when Trace was eliminated for the bond market yeah. and all of a sudden bond traders, I was not one of them, but I heard about it. <laughs> you know, they could all, there was transparency uh, to the price and also buyers brokers have to uh, yeah. sign an agreement. So I think that there's going to be a lot ahead for us to see how this plays out. But to the, the biggest point is, yes, it sounds like fees are coming in. It's like they are just making things available and people can go in there and look up their look, own information. Yes. So um, realtors like Zillow, obviously losers. Are there potential winners here? Yes, there is. And you just hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, CoStar Group. They're an online real estate company. They have apartments.com, homes.com, a number of other brands, 10X, uh, basically data and, and analytics where people can go in and find out the information for themselves. Uh, you know, upstate where I've spent a lot of time, there's a lot of buying and selling um, by owner. This will enable people to do it. Even yes. real estate brokers, people are going to be able to get more gritty. I mean, now you have a lot of real estate brokers who uh, they wanted these big fees. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how some of these deals may probably come yeah. off the market. There's going to be all kinds of little side yeah. deals, I think. It's going to be it's, interesting. It's just to eliminating the middleman. If you want a middleman, yes. go pay for a middleman. If you don't yes. want it, you should be able to do it. Yes. Okay, so we've done this, Abigail. Now can you do car buying? Uh, can I do car buying? Yeah, just get rid of the dealers <laughs> for me. Uh, I, I could try, I mean, you broke, but unfortunately, I mean, I mean, you, you you'd broke, be you broke, you broke Trace. You've now really broken the National Association of Realtors. Do I'll, I'll car dealerships next I'll go to work for you. I'll go to work for you. Abigail Doolittle, she's going to be disintermediating different markets for us across the board here. We'll just check in with her she's on what markets we're she focused on next. plenty of free time. All right. Coming up, we're going to continue counting down to the closing bells with Dana Dioria, co-CIO over at InvestNet. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu with a doubt 10 minutes until we get to those bells. As we wrap up the week on a down note, Scarlett, we're looking at weekly losses yep. for most of the major indices here. Though it could have been a lot worse, right? I mean, you're still seeing a little bit of life in some of the cyclical names. And as we've been talking about today, you're, you know, if you're trading commodities, you actually did pretty well this week. As That's a good too. point. Yeah. And let's keep in mind also, you have triple witching. So volume is up and you may not be able yeah. to read too much into today's I, you know, action. I thought we had dealt with those witches the last time, <laughs> three months ago. They're back? The witches come back, oh, okay. yeah. They don't right. go away. Um, most of big tech is falling. If you look at the Magnificent Seven. I tell that joke, by the way, every triple week. That's okay. No, I, I, I like it. it but okay, no, no, I you. like it. Yeah. Um, the group is down 1.2%. The exceptions here are NVIDIA and Tesla. And, of course, there is some NVIDIA news that's coming up next week. So don't know if that's tied to that, but certainly anticipation ahead of that. And look at that. You mentioned how it could be worse. The Russell 2000, higher on the day. Yeah, higher on the day here. And maybe that... Uh ends up being the silver lining here and some of the sell-off that we are seeing in the large cap names is that sell-off, well actually a rotation, a rotation into some of those small and cyclical names, and maybe that could be the next leg higher for this market. Dana Dioria joining us right now. She's co-CIO over at InvestNet. And Dana, I do want to start there here with whether we are actually seeing a bit of a rotation or is this just an old-fashioned sell-off? <laughs> I think it might be the latter. I mean, of course, one day's action is really hard to read too much into, especially on a day like, to your point today, the triple witching. But um, yeah, I think, you know, given the main news that the market, I think, is thinking about right now, of course, is what's going to happen next week. What in terms of not that we're going to get a rate cut, I think that's, you know, off the table. But, you know, what is the Fed going to say? And if you think about where we started the year with six rate cuts being priced in, we're now down to about three, which is what the Fed has been saying. But I think there's a lot of question even around whether we're going to get the full three. So when I look at rotation into small caps, to a certain extent, you know, that I think that's typical market movements. Given mm -hmm. that small caps are more interest rate sensitive, I doubt it has to do with the current macro. Well, based on the current macro, based on Fed expectations, Dana, where are the investment opportunities for you and your folks over at InvestNet? Yeah, I don't think I mean, look, I'm a proponent of, you know, having that diversification into the smaller region. I think, you know, I often talk about the fact that whether you like it or not, you're very heavily concentrated, obviously, in mega cap tech, even active managers. Right. So besides just having an index uh, constituent there, I mean, even active managers, unless there's a lot of tracking error going on in that portfolio, you've got a lot of mega cap, large cap in your portfolio. So 100 percent, I think having that diversification tilting into the small cap arena, particularly small value is a good thing, uh, you know, but just it might be a longer haul to, to kind of get there for that for for returns there. Now, one thing to bear in mind when you're going into that sector, that area of the market is that it has outperformed inflation over time. And as we all know, PPI ticking up, core inflation, a little bit stickier, um, you know, in, in the event that we are having another inflation wave getting kicked off, mm -hmm. small value is another, it's another reason to potentially tilt there a little bit. 
Okay, so as we continue to wait for a um, a rise in small cap value that can that's sustainable, we are still looking at an S and P five hundred that's holding near record highs. The Fed has a dual mandate, right? Full employment and of course um, controlling inflation. To what extent does the Fed pay attention to what the market is doing? And given where we are right now, how the market has done in the lead up to this decision? You know, of course, you're you're one hundred percent right. The mandate is employment and inflation. Both of those signals, by the way, of course strongly telling us we don't need to cut rates right now. Um, yes, unemployment ticked up a little bit, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, the, the jobs market is strong. Initial jobless claims actually really holding strong. And of course, inflation, as we said, you know, kind of seeing a little bit sticky. But you, you're asking a good question, right? Is that really all that the Fed pays attention to? Does the Fed pay attention to what markets are doing? Yeah, probably to a certain extent. Do they pay attention to the fact that whatever they do, both sides of the political spectrum, somebody will find a problem with it. Um, do they pay attention to the fact that, you know, the federal debt is getting to a point where the longer they keep rates high, the more cost it is and, and really, you know, such a, a burden on the economy. So I think all those things to a certain extent do have to factor in. But of course, to your point, markets are doing phenomenally well. So honestly, that's another signal to the Fed uh, that they really don't have to reduce rates anytime soon. I want to ask also about another asset or asset class, depending on how you look at it. Bitcoin, of course, uh, making record highs this week. Uh, the ETFs, the 11 ETFs that are out there, uh, continuing to collect a lot of money. How are you thinking about allocation to uh, the cryptocurrency, given that these ETFs are doing so well? It's a great question. I think there's a lot in that, too. So I think the fact that you have spot Bitcoin ETFs now is really a tremendous development for the retail advisor investor community. Right. They now have a vehicle that's, you know, backed by the largest asset managers in the world, you know, kind of safe from the perspective of who's standing behind that return. So I think you're going to see a lot of interest that maybe wasn't there before when that vehicle wasn't there getting in. I also think advisors and investors have to pay close attention now to what vehicle they're in and how much they're paying for this. At the end of the day, you're looking for spot Bitcoin. So if you're in a, in a version of this that may be higher priced uh, and, and there's really no reason for that, you got to be kind of looking at that. But I think an interesting, to your point on allocation, an interesting kind of study came out, a couple of studies are out there now around what is a, an allocation to Bitcoin for the average person. And of course, some people, it may be nothing, right? This is, after all, sort of, to a, to a certain extent, still a very speculative bet. Yeah. Uh, but even even normal risk aversion, because of the high skew uh, associated with Bitcoin and the potential return for crypto, you know, a small allocation, 1% to 3%, even for normal normally risk-averse uh, investors, is not out of the realm because of the fact that you have that tremendous skew and that tremendous asymmetric upside potential. Are we going to see, I think, though, a lot of this get folded into some of those model portfolios as well, Dana? I mean, when I was talking to a lot of folks, they were saying that that could actually be another big catalyst for uh, retail investor adoption should they move in that direction. So I think that's another really interesting question. If you have asset managers willing to put out ETFs on spot Bitcoin, you know, in some ways you could say they're actually de-risking this for the average client because those are people who wanted to go into Bitcoin to begin with. Now they have a better vehicle, a better chassis to do it. But the day that a large asset manager puts one of these spot Bitcoin ETFs into a model, it's a different statement in a certain sense because now you're pulling in, to your point, you're pulling in a lot of assets that maybe we would not otherwise have gone, right? They're not particularly mm -hmm. looking for that vehicle. They're looking for an asset allocation. And it's your job as the overall asset allocator to decide if it belongs in there. So I think it is a very interesting part of this whole thing to watch to see wh which asset managers and who does that. All right, Dana, always great to talk to you. Dana Dioria there, co-CIO at InvestNet, helping us count down to the close. Just about uh, three minutes to go here. Scarlet and Sox still hovering about where they've been right now, actually right around the lows of the day. Yeah. At, you know, I was just looking something up as Dana was talking, and it looks like iBit, which is the um, iShares ETF, um, Bitcoin ETF, has taken in quite a bit of money again over the past week. But the ETF that's taken in the most money is the Schwab Dividend ETF. So mm. people are looking for income. They're also looking for speculation. <laughs> yes, of course, as they uh, always are here. But of course, uh, it's still the net effect of it all. We continue to move higher uh, in the crypto space, not necessarily on the day, but certainly on the week and the month as we break down all of the price action that we've seen on the day as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. 
And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Carol Masser, Shanali Bass again today for Tim Stenevic. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. Here on this Friday afternoon, Carol Masser, where we're yes. setting up here for a day of declines and, well, a week of declines, too rare week of declines for the S&P 500. Yeah, absolutely. And all I have to do is look at what's going on with U.S. rates here. I'm looking at the Treasury card. You've got a 10-year one at 431. We have definitely seen a reset when it comes to uh, the U.S. Treasury trade and the rate side of things. And I do wonder whether or not we see more momentum going into the Fed meeting or as a result of the Fed meeting next week, or do we get another reset, uh, maybe yields, maybe moving back a little bit. But really, that move up has been really remarkable. The two-year hitting that 470 level, going above that once again. And it's interesting. People are worried about the dot plot. But what's remarkable to me is just how much uncertainty that there would be between this Fed meeting and the ones where you would actually expect rate cuts to maybe sort of kind of start to happen. Well, uh, several in Inflation prints really hitting the tape before then. Yeah, well, we know nothing's going to happen next week, but they will be releasing their uh, projections for not just inflation, but where rates will be headed as well as GDP. And that's going to kind of set the tone and show us some of their thinking as they look to eventually start cutting rates. Yeah, and you're already seeing that reflected here in the swaps market. Everyone really expecting that dot to maybe drift down just a little bit from three rate cuts for the year to maybe potentially two. Whether that is the message coming out of Powell and company, we're going to have to wait until next Wednesday, of course, for that press release and that press conference. Meanwhile, here on this Friday afternoon, as we wrap up the week, right across the screen for most of the major indices, a Dow Jones Industrial Average looking like it's going to close out the day uh, down more than 180 points, roughly about a half a percent here on the day. The S&P 500 holding right around 5,011, down about 33 points or seven tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq down 155 points or a full percent here on the day. Maybe a bright spot, if you will. It's only about eight points. It's only about four tenths of a percent. But the Russell 2000 is going to close out the day in the green. All right. Interesting to see. Uh, S&P 500. Let me go there, guys. Not quite an even split, but close to it. 230 names, Scarlet, to the upside in the Friday trade. 273 to the downside. And volume, of course, in the S&P 500 definitely picked up because it is triple witching, up 60 percent uh, over the past 20 days. Let's take a look at the sector breakdown here. A lot of red on that screen because you've got Infotech, Communication Services and Consumer Discretionary all down at least 1 percent. That basically encompasses all of big tech. You're Green uh, highlights there are energy, utilities, and materials. So the commodities complex is showing a little bit of resilience here, and utilities also gaining one tenth of one percent. All right, a lot of red there on that screen. Let's go to some of the individual gainers, if I may, in the Friday trade. Uh, and let me start with uh, CoStar Group. Ticker is CSGP. This is number one gainer in the S&P 500. Thirty-eight billion dollar market cap company, provider of commercial and residential real estate information, analytics, online marketplace. So all in when it comes to commercial real estate. Well, real estate platforms, just a little bit of a backdrop here. Generally, we saw them under pressure today. The National Association of Realtors agreeing to settle litigation over commission rules for agents in a deal that shifts the way that agents communicate about commissions, potentially resulting in lower fees, so you can understand the pressure. However, Wall Street weighing in, CoStar Group, um, they, uh, Stevens analyst John Campbell calling it the biggest beneficiary of this, um, and some other analysts uh, kind of calling it a potential beneficiary of the changes. So, we did see some of them weighing in and kind of separating them out. Zillow, I don't have it up here, but I think it was one of the names that actually was under a lot of pressure as a result of this. It was down about 13 percent, but CoStar Group gaining more than 8 percent in today's session. Advanced Micro, again, among the top gainers in the NASDAQ 100 here. Bring up the trade there on that one, and this one gaining about 2 percent in today's session. Didn't see any fundamental news, but definitely a standout in the trade. And then one more for you, ticker is THR, Thurman uh, Group, uh, machinery equipment company, heating solutions company, announcing a $50 million share buyback plan hmm. for about a $1 billion market cap company. But this was an outperformer, up about 5.7% in today's session. So not a name we talk about a lot, but nonetheless an outperformer here today. And I'm going to talk about the underperformers here today, the decliners. And I'm going to give you a sampling of the indexes here. You have Adobe slumping on its outlook here. It raises questions about demand. This is one of your worst performers in the S&P 500, and it is also down the most since September of 2020. 
22. Of course, a lot of eyes on software there. But I also want to bring you the worst performer or among the worst performers here in this Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. Speaking of technology more broadly, because you did have NXP Semiconductors being one of the worst decliners in the index there, uh, still falling about 2.5%, really helping drag down the index. Remember, the reason I bring it up is this Netherlands-based company really fell on the heels of China asking electric vehicle firms to buy local chips. So you did see a number of firms drop on the heels of that news at first at Bloomberg News. Now, I also want to point out Immuneering here. This is a biotechnology firm that did face a wave of analyst downgrades today and cuts to its price target. This was a stock down more than 30 percent on the day and one of your biggest losers here in that Russell 2000, as we were talking about a little earlier ending up on the day. All right, uh, let's take a look at the yield space because it has been five straight days of a sell-off on that Treasury curve here, pushing yields higher on the day and on the week. In fact, we're up uh, about four basis points here on the two-year yield and only about uh, one to two on the 10-year yield. But on a weekly basis, we're looking at a gain of about 25 to 26 basis points on that two-year yield. That's the biggest weekly jump we've seen uh, on uh, a yield basis going back to October of last year. That 10-year yield also adding uh, as well here. Uh, so an interesting dynamic coming off the back uh, of those uh, two big inflation reports this week and heading, of course, in to next week's big Fed decision, and more importantly, that projection of economic conditions. Yeah, pretty remarkable, yeah. the trade that we saw and the reset it feels like this week. Uh, all right, guys, I'm going to go a little bit lighter here. Um, I've got a story, or we've got a story about the world's most expensive and you're going to debate how to say this. Um, Michelin? Michelin? Michelin, no. We're American, Michelin. Well, okay, I was, going the <laughs> I was going the French version, but I won't do that. Um, all right, Michelin meal. Uh, it's about half a million dollars. This is going to be served in space. Um, apparently, uh, less than 24 hours after the trip was announced, this is a, uh, about a, a trip into space. Uh, many people have already asked where they can sign up. Space VIP, I think, uh, uh, Shanali is the company. It's a luxury space travel company, and they've hired a, a Danish chef from a, a restaurant uh, for the six-hour high-tech space balloon trip, which is set to de debut next year. But apparently, you can eat. It's going to be expensive. Yeah, and, and here's a little about what you can expect on this journey here. The meal, remember, is about a half billion dollars. Um, but I guess if you could make it to space <laughs> anyways, yeah. you might be able to afford that. But the chef wants the dishes to be innovative, like the journey itself. So, well, I would um, hope so, Shanali. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if you just went up there and he just sure, serves you like some crudo and like, you know, uh, some crackers here, I think you'd all be disappointed. I, I'm confused. Explain this to me. So you're going up into space, right? How long do you have to stay there to, to, to have this meal? I don't know. Because I feel like aren't most of the consumer space flights are literally like 15 minutes or something, right? And you come no, the, actually the balloon trips, I think, are a little bit longer. Uh, oh, oh, so okay. you'd be up there it's for a Do tell. Hours. I've never been on a balloon trip to space, Carol Masser. Well, you live a much more charming I don't think it's started yeah. yet, so oh. I don't think any of us. <laughs> I have another question. Do you remember when we go to the Smithsonian, you can get astronaut food or astronaut ice cream? It's freeze-dried. Yeah, I was and it was just going to talk about that. Yeah. Are these going to be freeze-dried food items? No. They gotta cook. Can they cook in space? Have you not seen the bear? You know how it plays out. Come on. <laughs> in space? Yeah. I mean, let's... Let's go a little that. bit. Everyone's going to be yelling corner right. and back. I will say the menu here. has not been finalized, so they're still working okay. out okay. the details. Okay, TBD. Will it, will, it, will it be vegan and gluten-free? TBD. <laughs> but if you can get Charlie Bird on JetBlue, then, Bird, you know, man. I'll take that. <laughs> we can hang okay. out with that. You know, there's another story that caught my eye, which is um, some big-name investors, Bill Ackman, Kathy Wood, among them, this they are worrisome. fighting battles, yeah, on Facebook because there's people impersonating them trying to lure regular Facebook users to invest with them. There's one ad uh, that promised annual returns of 125%, another a 25% return in a week, and told victims to hold these three stocks and you'll be a millionaire. That didn't work out, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think what's more interesting is that they can't really, you know, fight this or get it all taken down as, you know. They but, tried, uh, they well, tried. It's the internet, you know, and I think if there's any equalizer out there for, you know, some of these uh, high net worth individuals, it's like, look, there's only so much you can do. If a bad actor is a bad actor, you know, lawsuits aren't gonna matter. It's kind of scary, you know, yeah. at, at one point, remember how much scammers had really taken away from so many people uh, without using a Bill Ackman. And, it, you know, the Bill Ackman's PR person had told the journal here that it's like a game of whack-a-mole. That's mm -hmm. how much these things are coming up across social platforms. It'll be interesting to see how some of these social media platforms also ultimately respond. Listen, Facebook came out and said what that last year they removed 1.1 billion pieces of spam content in the second quarter alone. So they're working on it, but it is like whack-a-mole, right? As soon they're as something's taken
taken it? down. How, how, Carol? <laughs> taking them down, finding them, oh. taking them down. Okay. They're responding to people saying, there's, hey, there's something going on here. I, I feel got, like every time we have these issues, it's always like, oh, we're working on it. And then, I have know, a Michelin meal to talking. take in a balloon. I got to go, space. guys. I'm just okay. going to tell you. Well, are you treating us? Uh, sure. I mean, it's only two million, Half a million among, amongst the each. four of Come us on. here. Love you guys so. enough that I would do that for you. Absolutely. All right. That is a wrap. Have a good okay. weekend. You know that's on. You know that's been recorded, right? Yeah. <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere in the digital space. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Happy St. Patty's Day, guys. Across platform, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We will see you again. Same time, same place on Monday. All right, our coverage still continues right here on Bloomberg Television. The close, it ain't over yet here. A closer look at some of the big factors that move the market here on this Friday afternoon. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back to the big program as we wrap up our coverage here on this Friday. A closer look at the equity markets down on the day and on the week. But what actually drove those moves? It is Factor Friday and Chris Kane joins us as he always does. Equity strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. And uh, Chris, we talk about uh, the main equity factors and how they performed uh, so far this year here. Uh, what, are you, what are you actually seeing? It's been a very strong year for traditional equity factors. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not getting maybe the attention that, that maybe it deserves. Um, you know, when you look at this stuff on a long short basis, you know, the, the main factors like high momentum stocks have beaten low momentum stocks by about 12% mm -hmm. in just two and a half months. Profitability is up 11%, low vol is up about 8%. Even value, which has uh, you know lagged for much of the year, has actually had a strong two weeks here. Mm -hmm. It's back to break even on the year. So you know most of these long short factors are working very well. We at BI have what we call an MVP factor, which is a multi-factor that, com yeah. that combines momentum, low volatility, value, and profitability. That's up 14% in just mm. two and a half months. So it's been it's been a strong start after a back and forth 2023. Okay, you mentioned traditional factors, and those are ones that we're all pretty familiar with. I haven't really heard about shareholder yield as a factor, but you did some research into that, and you compared it to um, dividend yield. That's kind of so somewhat related. What did you find, and what's the main point of distinction between them? Sure. So, you know, we talked to a lot of customers who like dividend yield, right, to yeah. pick stocks with dividend yield. And, and, and as the general thought is, is, right, the, uh, you know, money returning to shareholders. Shareholder yield, in my view, is a more holistic way to look at money returned to shareholders. So it's through not, buybacks or? So it's not just through buybacks. It's through basically all direct and indirect means. So it, it includes dividends, changes in capital stock, a.k.a. buybacks, um, differences in, in long and short-term debt levels. Okay. So it's a more holistic way. When you look at the long-short uh, shareholder yield factor compared to the dividend yield factor, the performance is kind of night and day. Mm -hmm. So high shareholder yield companies have beaten low by about 60% since 2010. High dividend yield companies have actually trailed mm -hmm. uh, low dividend yields in that same, uh, that same time frame. Even over the last year, the, the performance has even extended. And when we look at what potentially might happen in the future, and we did some you know, fundamental deep dives on these portfolios, you know, I'll, I'll spare you the numbers, but the high shareholder yield portfolio is fundamentally stronger. It basically is cheaper valuations than dividend yield in the market and higher profitability than both dividend yield and the market. So when you stack that up against the other factors here, is that winning or is it on its way to winning? Are we going to be talking more about that later this year rather than momentum stocks? I, I, I think so. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's up so far this year. Um, you know, I, I think it's well positioned, you know, but the one thing when we have a kind of a non-traditional factor, I guess, is the one thing quants always say is like, yeah. what other factors does it load on? So to me, dividend yield and shareholder yield are broadly value factors, yeah. right? But when you look at the cross-factor loading, something really interesting happens. When you look at high shareholder yield and high dividend yield, they both load positively on value, mm -hmm. but dividend yield actually loads negatively on growth. So mm -hmm. it has lower growth in the market, where shareholder yield is actually neutral growth. Yeah. So being a value factor and not explicitly anti-growth yeah. has really helped it outperform over the last 10 years. All right, Chris, we're going to have to leave it there. And I really encourage all our viewers, you got to track uh, Chris and, uh, and, and his team and everything that they do. They have some of the best models uh, out there here. A closer look at the factors moving the market with Chris Kane over at Bloomberg Intelligence. Now let's pivot from markets and talk a little bit about politics because it's been a busy week there, particularly for the former president of the United States, of course, now the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party's uh, nomination. But of course, he's got a lot of court cases in 
front of them. The latest hush money trial, at least the one, the big one that we all talk about, could be a complication for prosecutors and efforts to try other criminal cases before the November 5th election here in the United States. That actually raises the very weird prospect that Donald Trump could be elected president and even take office before being tried on some of the most serious charges against him. Here to talk a little bit more about what's going on uh, on the election trail and in Washington is Andy Blocker. He's Invesco's global head of public policy, and he joins us not from Washington, but from New York. Great to see you. Good to see you. Let's, talk, let's start off with the former president here. He's obviously going to end up being the nominee. And we are in kind of this sort of weird netherworld where he could potentially win this election, yet still have very prominent court cases still facing him that in theory could have potentially disqualified him from being president. Well, that's true, Romaine. And look, I mean, we are in a very weird situation here. Um, but I think a lot of people in the Democratic Party want him to stand trial before. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that's what they should want. Mm -hmm. I think this because I think a lot of people who aren't Democrats think that it's a uh, it's a political prosecution, all of them. Mm -hmm. And so they should really want to go to the ballot, ballot box head to head without any of the trials and go from there. So head to head on the issues. On the issues. And not, not a galvanized right that, that, that looks at their a candidate as being under attack. Is that the That's correct. Idea? So, but what issues there are out there? Because whenever I hear the pundits talk about the issues, they're saying it's not really the economy. It's not a, the traditional things we all talk about. It is sort of these culture war issues and more importantly, the iconery around these two candidates. That's right. And so normally it's Maslow's hierarchy yeah. of needs, physical yeah. safety, am I safe, crime, immigration versus, you know, the economy. Look, I think if those things are kind of put to the side, it really comes down to, one, Biden's age. Mm -hmm. And I think he made a step in the State of the Union. We'll see if that lasts. Yeah. Um, and then with Trump, I think it's a number of issues. I think, number one, it's the Dobbs decision mm -hmm. and how he navigates that. Yeah. And I think the, the, Trump, the Biden administration and the Biden political team is going to try to remind people all the things he said with respect to democracy, mm -hmm. right about January 6th. And then it's really the Donald. I mean, how disciplined <laughs> will he be, right? And what is he going to say? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is going to be a really, really long campaign season because I can't remember the last time, if ever, you had the two candidates already basically announced um, at this stage of the year. So when you think about how to position for either outcome. Americans are kind of like, I don't even want to think about this until about October. But you've been talking to a lot of clients overseas, and they're really keyed in on this. Why are they so much more curious about what's going to happen than Americans? Well, I think, yeah, I was just in London and Dublin, and I think and if you look at continent Europe, it's the same. It really impacts them from an international policy perspective. Um, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Jo Joe Biden is really about measured uh, policy and multilateral action, whereas Donald Trump's volatile. It's volatility and it's going to be bilateral action. Mm -hmm. And specific to Europe, it's going to be about Ukraine, Ukraine funding. We've heard it reported that Donald Trump has said he's not going to give a dime to Ukraine, and that's, that's really on their border. So it's really important to them. So that's why I think they're so hyper-focused on it. How much of the Ukraine stuff can be taken care of before the election, just in Congress? So look, I think they can do, there's been this package that's been about there for some time. The Senate's passed it. The House, the big question in the House is whether the Speaker will put it on the floor because he could potentially have his speakership at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had the most four leading statements from him recently where he said, look, I'm thinking about putting it on the floor. Uh, we'll see what happens to his speakership. But I think it will get to the floor. And I think it's not going to be $60 billion for Ukraine. Uh -huh. It'll probably be about $40 billion. Mm -hmm. But I think that gets to the end of the year. And depending on who's president, That'll determine whether there's continued funding. I want to get your thoughts on another bill working its way through Congress, mm -hmm. and that's this TikTok ban. It's already made it through the House. What's the prospect of it actually getting through the Senate, even out of committee? That's a tough one. I mean, yeah. look, you can see the overwhelming vote in the House. Yeah. That put a lot of pressure, but you see a lot of comments saying, hey, let's, let's do the normal process. When they say normal process, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they mean <laughs> we're going to give it the slow death. Yeah. But because it's seen as anti-China, uh -huh. I wouldn't bet against it having a chance. So yeah. I think right now they're saying, wait a second, let's see what happens. Yeah. And, um, but I think, and also you have to look at what the Chinese said. The Chinese said, we're, we're not selling this. If, if, yeah. if, if we don't have it, no one gets it. No one gets it, yeah. Uh, the lobbyists are busy at work then in Washington. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Andy Block of, Blocker of Invesco, really appreciate it. So we talked about TikTok. We're going to continue on that uh, vein because we're going to discuss what it could mean for the world of advertising with Mark Douglas, the CEO of Mountain. If TikTok goes away, does Meta definitely benefit? How about Snap? This is The Close on Bloomberg. Wednesday. 
The Fed decides. They are scared stiff of getting this wrong. The markets are just primed for the big green light. Trust Bloomberg to bring you the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis, including Powell's press conference. We want to see more good data. We're still seeing sticky inflation. How dependable is the data? How long does it need to be good? Six, seven, eight months? Tune in to Bloomberg Surveillance. The Fed decides starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Context changes everything. The House of Representatives passed a bill this week that would ban the video app TikTok over concerns of Chinese data mining. So while it faces an uncertain future in the Senate, investors have already started lining up their bids. Here now to discuss what this might mean for the world of advertising is Mark Douglas, president and CEO of the advertising software company Mountain. Uh, great to speak with you, uh, Mark. And I guess the, the, the best way I want to start first is to get some context here about just how big TikTok is. It's a Chinese held company, so we don't have a lot of transparency into this. Uh, but it, what is its digital ad share in the United States? I mean, it's nowhere close well, to Meta, but is it getting no, good I think, ground? I, I, the numbers are not disclosed. Um, if you look at like Amazon, Amazon is 30 billion going on 40. So I don't think TikTok is that large. Mm -hmm. It's definitely in the billions. I wouldn't be surprised if it's over 10 billion annually. Okay, got it. So what we've understood is that um, certainly it's nowhere close to Meta, but it has it's it's very sticky when it comes to speaking to this audience, this young audience, this coveted audience yeah. as well. Um, TikTok users would be looking for an alternative immediately, if not already. Do we just presume that they'd go to Instagram or YouTube? Well, in terms of the users, I'm not so sure. I mean, they, they, you can never predict consumer behavior for advertisers. I think not. I think most see average performance advertisers, the kind that advertise on Mountain, on Google, on Meta, and and TikTok, Amazon. They're kind of like stock market investors. If like a stock's doing bad, sometimes they're like, well, let's just sit on cash. And so I think if somehow TikTok went away, I don't think that money automatically goes to 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 Meta and Instagram. I think actually that a lot of those advertisers are just going to regroup. They're going to rethink where they're spending those dollars and hold on to them for a while. I, I am curious, too. There's a geographic component to this as well, Mark. I mean, with all the discussion about whether China would actually relinquish TikTok and whether it ends up in U.S. hands, there was still this broader discussion here about the idea that advertisers still want U.S. eyeballs. So the idea is that if those U.S. eyeballs gravitate to whatever, you know, the, the next platform ends up being, is that where the advertisers are going to go? Is that the concentration? They, they will if the platform has all the features they need. So you have to remember... Platforms like Google and Meta, they've had decades to perfect reaching consumers and putting, you know, the right ad in front of the right consumer. So just having some new app that gets really hot and exciting mm -hmm. does not automatically guarantee that the advertisers will follow because they're looking for all of those performance features that those platforms provide. So that that money, you know, it'll create a little bit of a hole because I think TikTok was getting pretty good at performance advertising. Right. But they weren't so good that advertisers were like, you know, lost if TikTok doesn't exist. There had been just some discussion that TikTok would actually see a significant increase in advertising given the election cycle, not just here in the U.S., but around a lot yeah. of developed nations. Uh, is that in jeopardy now, given whatever the heck's going on in Washington? Well, that's kind of a different story. Like the, the uh, those kind of dollars just go out very broadly. It's more like television, you know, it's like broadcast television. Uh -huh. um, so, so yeah, those dollars will easily find another home. And honestly, those dollars would probably go to TV. They wouldn't go to another digital platform. Also, TikTok's typical user, I don't necessarily think is the exact voter that the Republican Party and Democrat Party are looking for. So I think they would have gotten uh -huh. some of that, but I, I don't, I'm not sure they would have gotten yeah. much as most people would think. You're saying they just want old people who still watch linear TV? Mark. Well, maybe, <laughs> you know, 40s, People yeah. go. People actually get off the yeah you know, get yeah. off the couch and go vote. Yeah. They want reliable <laughs> voters, basically, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They want to preach to the choir. It's kind of surprising. I've talked to a lot of those. 
firms that do that kind of advertising. And it's more preaching to the choir than like trying to convince a Democrat mm. to become a Republican and, and vice versa. And obviously everyone's sure. focused on independent voters. OK, yeah. so they might want to preach to the choir, but they can do so through influencers. Uh, if you're an influencer, yeah. how do you prepare for the possibility that TikTok in a certain amount of time might go away or might be sold? Are you I mean, obviously you want to diversify your into your different platforms, but there's no guarantee that uh, your sponsors will follow you. Yeah, I, I was going to say you sell that Ferrari you bought in Los Angeles. So <laughs> <laughs> get out of that lease because I don't think you you know, all of a sudden people find you on another platform. I think um, there's a lot of data that shows like if you lose access to a platform you're popular with mm -hmm. or unless say you were on YouTube and you were very popular there and then you try to move that audience to Instagram, it doesn't actually happen that easily. Uh, so I think if I was an influencer, I'd be very worried. All right. <laughs> and, well, yeah. Influencers are making plans then. Mark, really appreciate your joining us. Mark Douglas, uh, the president and CEO of Mountain. Coming up, we're going to get a read on the health of the global consumer from the CEO of Inter IKEA group. This is The Close on Bloomberg. The CEO of Hertz is stepping down. Bloomberg is reporting right now that Hertz plans to replace CEO Stephen Scheer. This is after that big bet on electric vehicles turned in to, well, not quite as they had planned. Now, former Cruise COO Gil West will be stepping into his place here. Uh, Hertz shares are getting a modest bid here uh, in after hours, trading up about 1%. Once again, the headline, Stephen Scheer, uh, the CEO over there at Hertz, the chairman as well, uh, stepping down as CEO. And we're told that Gil West will fill that CEO role. Detroit Bureau Chief David Welch joining us right now for a little bit more on this. And can we trace a line from this decision back to that decision a couple of years ago to make that big bet and that big purchase of electric vehicles? Yeah, so clear, clearly it is. Uh, you know, this, this is a business that has recovered since the pandemic and at other companies, uh, specifically Avis, their chief rival, uh, enterprises private, so we don't get to see uh, their financials, but Avis has made pretty good money. Hertz lost money and twice as much as the street thought in the fourth quarter. And a lot of that is because of this 245 million dollar charge because of all these EVs uh, that they bought, mostly Teslas. They uh, The cars depreciated faster. They weren't renting out as much. They didn't get as much for them at the rental counter. And there were higher repair costs. And they really went along with it. Uh, the, the only odd thing about this is well, the uh, the people at Knighthead and Centauri's, they're the two private equity companies that bought Hertz and took it through bankruptcy. Yeah, This was kind of their strategy. They brought Stephen Schur in to execute it. So there must have been disputes over how it was executed because yeah. this wasn't only his baby, but he's he, he's essentially leaving as, as this is being unwound. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I was interested about here, Scarlett, because I was looking at the timeline mm -hmm. and I'm like, they made that decision to buy these vehicles before Share was actually put into place. Yeah, and it's not yeah. a one-man decision either, yeah. right? I mean, this is something that the company got yeah. on board with. So, David, what's interesting here is that Stephen Scheer uh, is leaving or is being pushed out because of this, and he's being replaced by Gil West, who's a former CEO of G GM's Cruise Robo Taxi unit. Does that mean that Hertz is backing away from EVs, but maybe transitioning more towards focusing on self-driving cars? How do we read into that? No, I think it's more you look deeper into Gil West's background. He was at, he was the COO for uh, Delta Airlines. So I think they're looking for somebody with consumer experience uh. Uh, in, in you know flights, scheduling, travel, that sort of thing. Hertz has done this before when Car uh, Carl Icahn was the controlling shareholder. They hired John Tagway from United Airlines. Uh, it, it didn't work out that well. John was only there a couple of years, and Hertz never really got out of trouble under Icon's leadership, no matter who we put in the chair. But, you know, they're, they're looking for someone with that travel expertise who can do scheduling, fleet management, and that sort of thing like you do with, with planes. I, I think the challenge for somebody like Gil West, the same thing with Stephen Schur and with Autopass CEOs, is where you make or break companies in, in the rental business is do you yeah. buy the right vehicles and you do, and you buy the right amount of them at the right time? Yeah. And that's yeah. where the Hertz has got in trouble is mistiming the market with the vehicles they buy sure. and getting burned in the used market later. Okay, so it's managing inventory and also uh, optimizing the experience. David Walsh, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Detroit Bureau Chief. We want to transition now and really focus on the state of global sure. retail Thanks. through the eyes of one major brand. 
I'm pleased to say welcoming, uh, I'm pleased to welcome now John Abrahamson Ring. He is CEO of Inter IKEA Group, which coordinates development supplies and strategic direction for IKEA's franchisees. We just talked about how managing inventory is just as important as managing the consumer customer experience. I'm curious from where you sit, what you're seeing uh, when it comes to consumers and what they're willing to spend on, because there is of course, a robust uh, consumer market in the United States, and demand has not dropped off, but people are becoming more selective. They're shying away from luxury goods and maybe downgrading a little bit here. What are you seeing? Well, mainly we see three things. We see that the importance of the home has uh, uh, continued to increase since the start of the pand pandemic. Uh, so improving your home, making your home more safe for your child, uh, organizing your home better, be able to work from home, that continues that trend. And it's actually globally. We see it, we have 63 markets and we see it very similar across all our markets, uh, globally the same. The second trend we see is, of course, inflation that has uh, reduced all our wallets, uh, where more of our uh, share of our wallets has to go to necessities, and this, of course, is also. And the third trend we see very much now coming is also this uh, looking for uh, sort of really good uh, value for your money, and that has been that has also been very prominent now. So we do see that the home furnishing category is slightly decreasing, but within that you're looking for uh, even more value for money. And this is very beneficial for IKEA. We right. are very, uh, this has happened before in 2008 and in other uh, you know, economical difficult times, IKEA has always been very successful in those times. In November, I believe you said that IKEA is going to cut prices on all of its 9,500 products because of lower costs in raw materials as well as shipping. How far along that process are you? Is that done? Yes, so our ambition is always to have lower prices. Sure. Our mission is to help as many as possible with great home furnishing and lower prices is a great enabler of that. It was extremely painful uh, uh, when during in the aftermath of, uh, aftermath of uh, the pandemic, the whole supply chain was very disrupted right. and we had to eventually increase our pay prices in that. I am very happy and very proud that we are now decreasing our prices across the board, across all 63 markets, and that we take that step by step and then it looks different in each market but here in the US we've been going through the US uh, our US business this week and I'm very happy to see now that we have lowered the prices to close to a thousand of those nine and a half thousand uh, nine and a half thousand products already here in the US. Well talk to us a little bit more about IKEA's footprint here in the US in terms of store expansion but also the types of stores I mean most people associate IKEA with sort of the big cavernous stores where you kind of go through the maze and, and, and pick up everything and eventually you find the exit by the way yes. we can talk about that after the show. Show. Yeah. But you've experimented with smaller stores yes. and, and stores that didn't even necessarily carry the items themselves. It was kind of a showroom. Are you yes. still doing that? Yeah, so first of yeah. all, our big stores are still very popular. Yeah. So we have 860 million visitors uh, yeah. every year to our stores, and mm -hmm. that keeps quite, uh, we mm -hmm. sustain that level. So we yeah. are very happy for that mm -hmm. uh, in that. The second is, of course, that e-commerce has also grown yes. dramatically now, yeah. uh, especially since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So today that's 25% of our turnover is mm -hmm. on e-commerce. We get better and better at that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, of course, the interaction, but also the fulfillment of that that's yeah. working. And there we can actually utilize our big stores as yeah. a good uh, section. The smaller formats is still very uh, a great opportunity. It's right. a great opportunity in all our markets, but also here in, in the US. Yeah. Of course, we are sitting in the middle of New York here, yeah. and it's very busy streets. A lot. It's very yeah. difficult to find a, f a footprint where we can put the 250,000 yeah. uh, square feet store here. Right. So, yeah. And we see that being a great opportunity. But what we have learned mm -hmm. is that when customer comes to substantially smaller footprint of IKEA, they have quite similar expectations. Yes. They want to find all all uh, the width of our assortment. Mm -hmm. So they want to be able to find sofas, bookcases, yeah. uh, everything. But they also want to carry home things right. to a much larger extent than we thought. Yeah. So we see customer who comes there and they want to yeah. take the Billy bookcase with them home. Right. Well, I was one of those. I mean, we actually opened up, uh, you, you guys opened up one right across from Bloomberg headquarters yes. a while ago. That was before the pandemic, I think, and, and it closed down. I am curious, you, you said 25% e-commerce, yes. right? Yes. I'm actually surprised that's not higher. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of people like going into 
into those yes. stores, but yeah. I would just think, given how most of us in the yeah. early days of IKEA's presence here in the U.S. got right. exposed to it through the actual physical catalog yes. that would get mailed and everybody yes. would leap yes. through it, I would think that that would have translated to a higher e-commerce business. Yeah, this is yeah. the global number. And in yeah. different markets, there is uh, different variations. Gotcha. We have markets okay. that are up on 40, like the UK, uh -huh. et cetera. But yeah. I think overall, this is a big step for us. Before the pandemic, we were on 5%, uh -huh. and now it's on 25%. Oh, wow. okay. yeah. So that is a big step uh, for us. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. John Abrahamson Ring, the CEO of Inter IKEA Group, uh, giving us some perspective here on the Billy Bookcase along with the other uh, items of IKEA furniture in all of our homes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let's just get a quick recap on how the markets closed on the day and on the week. Uh, red on the screen here for the day and for the week, the S&P losing two thirds of one percent. We also saw uh, treasuries decline for a fifth straight day. The 10 year yield ticks up by one basis point to four point three percent. The VIX also moving higher as well. One thing we do want to pay attention to remain is dollar yen with the BOJ meeting next week. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of focus here <clears throat> yeah. on whether that that central bank is going to end its negative rate policy. Yeah, you know how many stories I've read today about the market positioning around this? And every story I read, I was like, why are people positioning around this? You're going to be disappointed. <laughs> I, I don't care whether you, where, what your direction is. I guarantee you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, the BOJ yeah. hasn't exactly done what yeah. it, it's been reported to do. This is true. That's, that, that hasn't worked out at all. All right, we're going to talk more about uh, what's coming up here, especially in uh, green energy. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our next up segment. This is where we highlight the entrepreneurs, the founders, and of course, the people funding them who are really moving the needle for our economy, markets, and technology. And today, we're gonna to focus on shipping products because it's one of the main challenges that small businesses and e-commerce merchants face in this day and age. That's why startups like Shippo work with carriers like UPS, like FedEx, like DHL, and others to navigate the process as efficiently and affordably as possible. Laura Barron's Wu joining us right now. She's the CEO of Shippo and the co-founder. And I always love these types of stories, uh, Lauren, because this was an idea really born out of your own frustrations and trying to build your own online store. So basically you saw a problem and unlike the rest of us who would just, you know, sit around and grumble about it, you decided to do something on it. Talk to us about what the original idea was. Did you think it would end up like what Shippo is now? Has it is it materially different than that kernel of an idea? Yeah, thanks for asking. So I'll, I'll take you back down memory lane. Um, in 2013, my co-founder and I, we started an e-commerce business. Um, it was just a, a small business. We, we were using online tools like Shopify and Stripe to build our own little storefront. And um, when we started selling products online, we realized that shipping is a real pain point. We realized that we had to go to the USPS to stand in line to ship our packages every day. We had to compare different shipping providers. And that was just really difficult and complicated to do. Um, we were trying to figure out how to offer an excellent shipping experience, uh, the, similar to what Amazon is offering. And we realized that was highly complex, very difficult, and very expensive. Mm -hmm. So out of that frustration, um, we decided to build Shippo. And yeah, Shippo is a platform, is, is a platform that powers shipping for e-commerce. Right. And basically, the premise is the premise is just that every single e-commerce store needs to ship, and we're here to help help uh, make it easier and better for our customers. So explain to me how this differs from the relationship that a third-party seller would have with Amazon and its logistics business, or even uh, with, the, with the sellers who are on the Shopify, Shopify platform. How does Shippo differ from that? Yes. So... It starts with a lot of our customers don't want to sell on Amazon. They want to own their own brand experience and they have their own little uh, websites and their own storefronts where they're selling and yeah, where they're selling out of. So you're going on the, our, our customers' websites, not on amazon.com to buy the products. And when, when you do that, our customers need to own the end-to-end -end shipping experience. They're responsible for shipping out a package. They're responsible for running their warehouses and um, they're responsible for making sure the package arrives at the customer's doorsteps. And that's where 
we come in for these kinds of customers who are owning their own brand experience and brand is incredibly important in today's day and age, we're powering shipping in the background. And um, about Shopify and Etsy and all these other platforms, we seamlessly integrate with the platforms to make sure that our customers can import their orders directly from where they sell to Shippo, where they ship, and um, fulfill the orders and ship them to their customers. Laura, what's the most common and most surprising problem that your customers face? I think, okay, so it's important to understand that shipping is not just about buying a label to ship your package. It is a whole process that starts from pre-purchase to post-purchase. Mm. So our customers need to figure out how to set the right shipping rates at checkout. Not setting the right shipping options can decrease your conversion rates. So it's really important to have the right shipping strategy in order to be successful as an online merchant. And then post-purchase, our uh, online, online shoppers, they're looking for return options that are readily available. If those options are not available, then customers are also not going to buy at your store so I think the big uh, the big mindset shift that our customers are experiencing is that shipping is more than just buying a shipping label. It's really this end-to-end -end customer experience that helps you sell more online and be more successful as a merchant. Absolutely. So if you if you notice, um, I mean, I think we all have, when we buy things and we need to return them, things are no longer free to return. We now have to pay some kind of fee, a restocking fee, however they want to call it. How has that, is that a result of what, the pain points that they see in the whole shipping process overall, how has that evolved? Yes, so what we're seeing is that, well, free shipping has never been free. I should start with that. Someone needs to pay the shipping fees, be it the outbound shipping or the return shipping fees. Someone's paying for that. And many times, or most of the times, it is the online merchant who's paying those fees. I think in today's economic environment, we're seeing that our both our merchants as well as online shoppers are um, more sensitive around those shipping fees. So online shoppers, they're more, they're, they prefer free shipping obviously over uh, paying for shipments, but they're also willing to wait longer for a package to arrive. So the notion of everything needs to arrive next day or within two days has gone away. Mm. And I think that's a strategy that we've seen our customers like employ pretty successfully and effectively offering free shipping, but free shipping that takes significantly longer. I think as for returns, we're still recommending our customers to offer free returns. Um, it is like one of those things that are that online shoppers are looking out for when they yeah. buy online online. Many times a, a sale cannot be successfully made unless the return experience it is what the online shopper is, experience, is expecting. Well said. Laura, really appreciate your joining us. Laura Barons Wu, the Shippo co-founder and CEO with the story of how her company came about. Thank you so much. All right, let's get now to the top three, uh, where we take a deep dive into some of the people at the center of the day's most talked about stories. And this is one where the headline crossed earlier today. Sam Bankman Freed. Prosecutors are saying the former head of FTX should get 40 to 50 years behind bars for his role in the collapse of FTX, uh, his cryptocurrency exchange. They're calling it likely the largest fraud of the decade. Uh, they're saying it is necessary. It involved more than a million victims and losses of more than $10 billion. That's according to a court filing. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, obviously they'll probably not get that. I would think usually these are kind of, they go pie in the sky with the idea uh, that it gets down here. But it gets to this idea though too, is like, what is the appropriate punishment mm -hmm. for something like this? I mean, look, 40 to 50 years, I don't want to make light of the damage that he caused, right? But you have, you know, violent criminals who do less time in jail for their crimes. For what it's worth, yeah. his lawyers are recommending six and a half years. Okay, well, that's a pretty wide disparity <laughs> there. I think uh, the prosecutors and the defense lawyers are going to have to sort of uh, try Huddle. to bridge that gap. Be interesting to see where they meet. Another person I'm keeping an eye on, and he could actually be, end up being a really important figure here. His name is Pete Distad. You probably haven't heard of him, but he was a top executive over at Apple, and he was really responsible for the rollout of a lot of those big TV programs. He's now been named the new CEO of that sports streaming service that we've been talking about, Scarlett. You know, ESPN, Fox, Warner Brothers, all colluding to, to offer this uh, you know, new sports product, and he's going to head that up. Well, his first job is to come up with a name because there's still no name for this service. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, we just keep calling it this um, streaming service that ESPN, Fox and Warner Brothers have teamed up on because they're all losing subscribers. And this is their solution, even mm -hmm. though we know that it doesn't even begin to cover all the sports available. Yeah. I mean, this is in addition to the, obviously the operations and logistics behind it. This is going to be a big marketing push as well that they're going to need for this. All right. Let's take a look at our third person. He is John Waldron. He's the Goldman Sachs COO. And the firm bumped his pay package by 28 percent to 30 million dollars. 
That is despite an earnings uh, slump at the company. Of course, we all pay attention when Goldman Sachs uh, earnings and in particular pay packages come out because they kind of set the tone for the rest of the street. Yeah, it sets the tone for the rest of the street. I, I'm intrigued about two things. A, the fact that he got as much as he did given the performance last year. The fact that he's basically making a similar amount, at least on a mm -hmm. total comp basis, as the CEO, uh, David Solomon. And of course, all the reporting that we've done here at yeah. Bloomberg News about maybe some of the concerns about leadership. Some of the tensions, yeah. you know, yeah. some of the back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a perennial soap opera over there. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, yeah, but, you know, a very well-paid soap opera. Yes. At least if you're yes. at the top of the company there, right? Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about what's coming up this weekend. Uh, epi episode six of the new Bloomberg Originals show, An Optimist Guide to the Planet. It is out, and you, you can check it out because it focuses on beyond the climate crisis to transform both the future and how our civilization will face it. Nikolai Kosserwaldo visits Germany, where one company has found an ingenious solution to storing energy generated from wind turbines. When we started developing this master plan with all the wind turbines and all the photovoltaic systems, we would always face situations where the wind is not blowing and the sun's not shining. Sure. That part in the year, you probably need to have a storage that keeps roughly a fifth of Germany's electricity consumption okay, quite over a, a year. Yes. So, and then uh, having a storage that is this big, it was absolutely clear from the beginning we can't keep it in batteries. Oh. Uh, and then the question was, where can we keep it? So this is why we went, okay, so when we have excess of electricity coming from renewable sources, mm -hmm. we take the electricity, run an electrolysis system, and then create hydrogen and then store the hydrogen underground. And by converting it into hydrogen, we can transfer this energy into other industry sectors. And that was Hans uh, Schaefer there. If you really haven't checked out this program, you got to. Episode 6 is now out, The Optimist Guide to the Planet. You can get it on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com. You could also get it, of course, on the more traditional platforms right here on Bloomberg Television. Really encourage everyone to watch all six of these episodes. A really uh, interesting concept here, not just about climate change and our planet, but quite frankly, the solutions and the people really driving that uh, forward. All right, uh, stick with us here. We're going to uh, take a quick break here, and then we're going to set you up for what could be a really busy week uh, up ahead. This is Bloomberg. It's going to be a busy week next week, so let's get right to it. We start with Monday and a big day for NVIDIA. Yeah, NVIDIA is holding its Developers Day, uh, Developers Event, really. It's called NVIDIA GTC, and it runs Monday through Thursday. And Jensen Huang, the CEO, is really under pressure in some ways to deliver and really tell everyone what else is next. And this is a stock that's performed incredibly well, obviously. Big point, too. We should point out these past developer days haven't moved the needle. But, of course, AI wasn't necessarily yeah. the elephant in the room like it is. We get some big rate decisions next week. Let's start in Japan. Japan, BOJ on Tuesday. If you believe GG News Agency, mm -hmm. uh, the Bank of Japan is getting ready to end its negative interest rate policy. But as you pointed out, we've had a lot of these uh, false uh, head fakes before. Meanwhile, false on leads. Wednesday, we will get that big decision out of the U.S. Uh, policymakers here. No change is expected, mm -hmm. but we are expected to get some insight into maybe what they do going forward. Right. And updated economic projections as well on GDP, on inflation, and on where rates will be. Uh, we also get a decision out of the Bank of England. Yeah. Bank yeah. of England comes out on Thursday. So we'll be covering that at 7 in the morning. And some earnings also as well to keep an eye on General Mills. Micron, Nike, FedEx, and GameStop. Does GameStop ever say anything, though? That's the thing. <laughs> no, it'll be like two sentences and a five-minute conference call. Go to the Reddit forum. But definitely tune in to us, because if they do say anything, we certainly will have full coverage of it right here on The Close. Tune in next week. This is Bloomberg.